Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all of you to the Soybean 360 Agro Processing in the Sub-Saharan Africa. I think there's a great topic to talk about in terms of production and efficiencies when you consider that the per capita oil consumption in Africa is 1.6 kilograms, whereas compared to the world average of 11.7 kilograms. So our intention here is with these four speakers who are acknowledged experts in their own areas to talk about what can be done to improve and get the agro processors in the African area to a higher level. We basically look at, do you understand the process? And I think we all agree that the processors do know that. Are they up to the industry standard? That's what we'll have to find out and work with them and then get them to a level where they will be industry leaders. There's a long process and we hope to start that off with Mike Boyer talking about industrial wastewater. And we are very pleased to have Mike here. Mike is an expert in the vegetable oil processing and wastewater resource areas. He has done excellent work over the past 50 years in the industry. And he's going to be talking about wastewater and he's based in Atlanta, Georgia. He's been a, a, a fixture in the AOCS. He has spent a lot of time with AOCS and we are glad to welcome him back to this session today. And we will have Mike on in a minute. Amy, thank you very much. Naya, thank you very much as well. I would say good morning to all of you, but uh, I know we have watchers from all around the world, so I'll just say welcome. Uh, I want to thank Naya again for that kind introduction. Uh, he and I have been colleagues, and I certainly count him as a friend for more years than I can think of now. Um, I'm going to try and condense 45 or 50 years of experience into 23 minutes, and that's always difficult to do. So my contact information is shown on the first slide, and I'm sure you can get it from AOCS. So if you have any questions about the subject in general or specific questions about a need you may have, feel free to email me, and I'll be happy to help you as much as I can. Uh, this world of uh, Zoom presentations and, uh, and the pandemic has... Uh, has put older people like me at a significant disadvantage. I'm at best a B plus Zoomer, and I hope this works out. You'll notice on the on the left of the first slide, my dog Cinnamon is here. She's always uh, in here in the office with me, and she's here today to offer comfort, but probably no IT skills. 
there's going to be time for questions at the end of this presentation. When, uh, when we get there, if there are questions, that's great. For those of you who have heard me speak before, you know that if I don't have any questions, I'll start asking the audience questions, and I'm not sure this is possible in this format, but I do have one bonus question to ask myself if it comes to it, so no worries. So the first thing I want to do is, is present this whole issue of water in a, in a broader framework and um, focus on some impact factors, and then I'm going to discuss um, some of the details about what works in process wastewater technology, and then I'll get on to innovation and what I think is probably the next big thing in this business. So my experience in Africa, like many people in North America and probably Europe prior to 2015, was limited to some, uh, some Tarzan movies on TV and reading articles about it. But that changed in two ways in 2015, or about then. <clears throat> I was contacted by a, a gentleman, a wealthy gentleman, who had a business in Angola to help him with some challenges. And he's not in agribusiness. He's basically in the solid waste business. I haven't been to Angola a lot but it, at all, actually, but it caused me to read up on the whole area. Then the other interesting thing, I, I, I interesting experience I had in 2015 is my wife and I actually went to Africa on one of these old people game watching trips, which was by far the best uh, vacation I ever had, and I just enjoyed it immensely. We visited uh, places in the sub-Sahara, uh, Botswana, uh, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and we flew into South Africa from Atlanta. Um, the flight from Atlanta to uh, South Africa at the time was the longest commercial flight in the world. It was 17 hours, uh, but we had to fly back through Paris. So I thought, well, this will be a lot shorter, but we flew from the south end of Africa all the way to Paris. And, and my conclusion that after that is Africa is really a big place. Um, one of the things, one of the experiences I had during the game watching trip, uh, I think the first day or the first week we were in the, in the Chobe wildlife area and we were on the banks of uh, either the, the uh, Zambezi River or one of its tributaries and you look over into uh, Namibia and, and, and there's elephants in front of you and lions off to the left and, and hooved animals of every kind and it's just a beautiful sight but the thing that struck me the most is looking across the river into the into the the delta and flatlands over there. It was cattle raising and and um, farming as far as the eye could see, and it just impressed me that there's more going on here in agribusiness than one might think. So that's been uh, an interesting for me to be able to go back to that experience as part of this, but. One thought I'll, I want to leave everybody with, and, and I have to remind myself on the Africa is really big, is that it, it's very difficult to make generalities about Africa. Africa is a continent, it's not a country, it's a collection of large and very diverse countries and people. So when you talk about Africa, you have to uh, be careful on generalities. Um, so as I tried to figure out what the state of the industry and in wastewater was, in Africa, I, I ran into this challenge in, in even a bigger way. Uh, there's not a lot of literature about what is going on in Africa. You have to break it down to countries and companies. And I, I found most of the major ag suppliers, the big companies, have a presence over there. Uh, some of them have processed facilities, but there wasn't just a lot of information about it. I found something similar on wastewater that, that processing companies and soybeans and vegetable oils are, are doing anything from just nothing to having some very sophisticated water management systems. So um, I think then let's go on and talk about what's, what is more important and that's what's going to impact the future. Um, we'll talk about these items and and what and what uh, what's going to happen now? Bart Scholes of Desmet talked on this same subject earlier in the presentation, and I went back and looked at his, and he had some int interesting thing to say about this as well, particularly in the process, technology, and innovation. 
when you one thing I've learned over my 40 to 50 years in this is as you look at the, the industry maturing in North America, and I believe you will see that in Africa, is that process technology and water management are rapidly converging into the same subject. Because if you can't control the process, you really can't control energy and wastewater. And then I'll talk about transportation and external factors, but let's talk about water first. Uh, I did a little bit of research and uh, <clears throat> this statistic is about, I think five years old, but Africa had 13% of the world's population and 9% of the water. So we're already starting out uh, kind of with our, with our position, not where we would like it to be on water. Now, has that changed? Well, it probably has. Africa probably has more people now, and, and at least the southern part of Africa has experienced a severe drought, so water continues to be an issue. On the good side of this, soybeans uh, are known to be a relatively drought-resistant crop. It takes about 400 millimeters of, of well-placed rainfall to develop a crop. Africa has an average, again, let's avoid generalities, but an average of 1,000 millimeters of rainfall a year, but that tends to be nothing in places and a lot in other places. So water will continue to be an issue. Now, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, I want you to remember this. This is a concept that I continually have problems getting across to management in, in large companies. And that is if you don't put meal and oil in the wastewater, you don't have to worry about taking it out and treating it. Uh, the other corollary to this is, is everything that you put in your wastewater, not only do you have to spend money taking it out, but then you have to, uh, then you, then you can't sell it. Everything that goes in there, you could sell. Now, clearly there's a minimum amount that has to be dealt with, but step number one has to be process loss control and wastewater management. Most of the, most of the innovations in process technology over the last certainly 25 years have not been fundamentally new ways to process soybeans or wastewater. They've been better ways uh, to minimize water and energy use. Transportation, why is it important to wastewater? Uh, one of uh, Naira's colleagues told me something maybe 10 or 15 years ago that I've hung on to, maybe longer than that now. And his comment was, is that in the end, the the soybean business and oilseed is all about transportation costs. In the end, most of the plants get to the same technology level and the company that has the most efficient transportation is the one that, that uh, creates the most benefit from a financial standpoint. Uh, so transportation impacts the size of your plants. It impacts the harvest of crops. I noticed that Eric Lane one of our speakers in the opening session talked about transportation, its importance. And uh, one thing I did observe in Africa is that, is that uh, certainly the transportation network of uh, roads and, and rail is not what it is in other places in the world. And that obviously will improve with time. Uh, but all this ultimately impacts your wastewater because if you have a very small plant and nowhere to discharge it, it's going to impact what you need to do. So let's take, let's focus just a second on external factors. Um, and I'm not gonna get into all of these, but they all have things to do with your business. And the common thing is, is you can't control a lot of them. These things are gonna happen and you just have to, just have to go with it. The final one is kind of my favorite. Who are these people? Well, a thousand years ago, we called them invaders. A hundred years ago, we called them colonizers. And today we might call them innovators or investors. But they're people who see value in Africa or, or anywhere else where they are. And, and they're coming to see you and help you. I'm gonna come back to that point more in just a little bit. So let's get uh, some real number practical look at this for just a second. Um, I, took, so I have some numbers for what I'll call a typical thousand metric ton per day soybean extraction and refining operation. Uh, I've worked at about 200 of these, uh, most in the North America, but some around the world. And I just, I'm going to show you what I think are some, some reasonable numbers that you might expect. And these numbers would occur 
after some sort of gravity separation for oil and solids. And, and this, these numbers do not include sanitary contributions or large uh, clean cooling water flows. So this is some numbers that you might expect. Again, uh, if you've got questions about your values, feel free to look me up and I'll give you some input on it. What about, what about treating this material and, and coming up with waters that meet a discharge standard or for recycle? What's the most important thing? What have I told you already? The most important thing is not even on here. The most important thing is process control and loss minimization. But after that, the next most important thing is gravity separation for oils and solids before anything else happens. The one unique thing about gravity separated oil, it's the only component that gets you in your wastewater that you might possibly be able to sell or reuse yourself. The rest of it is money down the drain. Uh, after separation, quite often we use uh, a froth flotation technology with chemicals to remove residual oils. And then depending upon the discharge point that you're uh, sending effluent to, you might look at biological treatment or final filtration. Again, a lot more can, can be said about these. So the other, one of the other really key points I wanna emphasize is when, when people work on wastewater treatment applications, they tend to spend 90% of the time thinking about treating the wastewater and 10% of the time thinking about the byproduct sludge and other residuals that come from it. I wanna assure you, you should do it just the opposite. The wastewater itself is relatively easy to treat. Dealing with the sludges and byproducts is always the bigger challenge. Uh, if you see uh, an equipment supplier or an engineer for those sludges and he gives you a drawing with a line going off the edge of the page and it says by others, by others is you. So don't lose sight of these. I showed you just in this, in this slide, just kind of a simplistic from the left to right version of what something like this might look like. The, the photo on the far left is the incoming wastewater. Uh, it then passes through this dissolved air flotation unit. You can see the froth flotation on the top. And the picture on the right shows you the treated water. This particular facility is one of my pride and joys, it always works well. If you look at the, uh, at the finished water, you can actually see the, the mixer uh, going down into the water, that's how clear it is. Now in this particular one, we actually have a pH monitor on that uh, final effluent to make sure it's within limits, and then we measure flow. And from that point, you might go on to a biological facility or whatever is needed for your application. So we have a saying in industry, that if you if you can't you can't manage something if you don't measure it, and that's true about wastewater as well. So these are the four parameters that I feel like are essential for managing any wastewater situation. COD is chemical oxygen demand. Uh, the final bonus question is BOD. What is it? And where does it come from? BOD is biological oxygen demand. Uh, if we have time, I'll get into that. If not, you'll have to you'll have to reach out to me. But the, there are other parameters beyond these that are of interest, certainly metals and phosphorus uh, and dissolved solids, but these are the ones that, that I usually use uh, for controlling for parameters. Uh, so what if you get in, need to get into biological treatment? This picture is a, uh, is a very interesting facility that we, that we uh, helped Fuji Vegetable Oil in Savannah put in. It's a, it's a activated sludge. If you want to know what a biological uh, activated sludge looks like from a color standpoint, that's a good healthy one. This facility has a membrane uh, filtration system, and that's kind of the next up and coming thing in the in the industrial wastewater treatment that produces a water that's just very, very clear and it can be used for tower makeup or even land application in certain crops. So what's the next big thing coming in the environmental and wastewater and um, sustainability area? Um, I, I noted earlier some, some things over which you have no control. Climate change is a good one. The picture on your, on your right is the Savannah Harbor at Savannah, Georgia. It's a, it's a site that I've been working on in vegetable oil refining 
since I actually started in the early 70s. And the Savannah Harbor is one of these rivers that had been in very poor shape. And over the last 40 years, through efforts of industry and municipalities, it's now very clean and has very good water. Uh, but it's just about that far from being perfect. And the regulatory community continues to seek perfection. And one of the things you find in life, of course, is that perfection is the enemy of success. So I have watched, I have watched various state and local governments spend fortunes trying to uh, make that a uh, cleaner water. Now, one of the other ironies of this that impacts Africa and the rest of the world is that Savannah is now the fourth largest container ship port on the east coast of the United States. And the Corps of Engineers who handle rivers and harbors in our country are dredging the harbor and, and making the channel deeper so we can get even larger ships in. Uh, why is that interesting? It's interesting uh, because of what I think is going to be happening in Africa over the next 20 to 50 years. I think Africa is going to, and, and this is not just my opinion, but one you can read a lot of places, Africa is likely to be the next Asia. Why is that? It's going to be the site where industry moves to. They have substantial natural resources. They have energy. They have increasingly stabilized governments. And most importantly, they have labor and lots of it and a good supply of it. And this is going to bring this to your shores. So what does that mean if you manufacture these facilities and you're going to, or products and going to export them? That means you have to have ports to bring them into. So now all of a sudden, the East Coast ports of the United States and the West Coast ports in Europe are becoming the more important ones. All that impacts water, certainly in Savannah, Georgia. So with that, I'm going to close with a few thoughts. Um, one of the things that one of the terms we use, and I would and I would challenge all those in Africa is focus on the long game or the, the long-term business strategy and don't get uh, taken away by short-term money. The long game tells you to watch for this change and learn to manage it or it will manage you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Naira or Amy, I guess, for questions. your knowledgeable thoughts on wastewater and African processing. And uh, any questions from anybody? I don't see any on the Google chat. I have one question for you, Mike. And that is, with all your experience, do you think the biggest impediment to better environmental conditions in Africa is improper handling of waste or lack of technology in waste disposal? Well, the technology is there in some places for sure. Um, so, so you really need to say what is improper. Uh, and it depends on whether you're looking at the, at the long-term strategy or the short-term strategy. Uh, improper handling usually means inadequate treatment and that's a short-term strategy. In the long-term strategy, I think uh, they would be well well spent to uh, invest more in wastewater and water management in general. Well, I think you hit upon that topic in terms of improper when you said, don't put oil and meal into water. And I think that if, you're, if you read up and talk to people in Africa, they 
they are more focused on getting the product out and do not, or at least that is my opinion, that do not spend as much resources or time in terms of avoiding those meal and water to get into the meal and oil to get into the water. And well, I think that I that's, go not, long way. that's not limited to Africa by any means, but I expect it's a challenge in Africa as well. That is correct. It, is, it even happens in the U.S. today for the, all the technologies you have. I see you smiling, so I know how you feel about it. <laughs> so thank you, Mike, and uh, we really appreciate your thoughts on it. And uh, anybody has any questions, you can reach out to Mike or you can reach out to me and I can direct you to Mike, whichever way you like. And Do thank I have you time so much. to explain do I have time to explain DOD or are we, are we at the end of the session? Amy, are, do we have a minute? To, I think you can go ahead, it's 826, so. All right, that's fine. So biological oxygen demand doesn't really measure anything. It measures how much oxygen is needed to degrade organics in your wastewater under certain conditions. So where did the test come from and why do we use it? We, we use it because we're hanging on to, uh, to an archaic piece of uh, testing. The British in the late 1800s were concerned about sewage from London going down the Thames River from getting into the, uh, and, and, and reaching the ocean and the Thames River being contaminated. And the time of travel in the river was five days. The British figured if everything was degraded in five days or if, if whatever got to the ocean, nobody cared about anymore. So they developed a five-day test. The reality is a five-day BOT test measures about 60% of the chemical oxygen demand, which is the total oxygen demand. So again, I'll stop here and thank everyone. My contact information's there, and I'll be happy to help you with any questions or issues you may have. Have a good day and be safe. Thank you. Good morning. We are pleased to welcome Stan Pala, the Global Sales Director of Oil Seeds at Solex Thermal Science. This is an interesting topic. Solex has been in the industry for many years and they are innovating the way you condition and use heat for soybean processing. And we are looking forward to hearing from Stan Pala, especially in terms of the constraints which the African subcontinent is facing. Uh, in general, the African subcontinent is got a, got a deficit in oil production and oil usage. They import more oil than they produce and the production is impacted because of lack of financial resources, raw materials, processing and packaging regulations, along with market accessibility, which Mike explained to you about transportation. I talked to a processor who has industry in Africa, and he told me if it takes 40 points to move a pound of product in the US, 
it takes about 400 points to move the same pound of product in africa because they have not they do not have railroad technology they depend upon trucks and trucks depend upon roads and roads are not very good and there is chance that the product will not get and supply chain is severely impacted i am sure it's getting better and i think everybody understands the need for it but it'll be interesting to see and hear from stan on his thoughts on the equipment and how they are going to solve the uh, supply chain demand issues take it away stan welcome hello uh, thank you nora and uh, thank you amy for, for the introduction um and uh, hello everybody and uh, i would like to welcome everybody at this symposium focused on the uh, soybean in sub sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, first of all, let me thank you uh, to the AOCS organizers for the opportunity to present our contribution to the oil seeds industry. Um, my name is Stan Power. I've been with uh, Solex for a little uh, than 10 years, and I'm responsible for the development and implementation of the technology into oil seeds industry globally. Generally, Solex Thermal Science is a Canadian company that uh, came up and developed uh, the concept of a plate indirect technology for heating and cooling of uh, bulk solids. And in addition to this, uh, Solex has later developed plate conditioners to provide this energy efficient solution to majority of the oil seeds processors, including soybean processing, either with warm or cold de-holing type preparation. Solid has applied this new technology on the very first installation in Canada on urea, cooling more than 30 years ago. And till now, the unit is still working well, still with the original parts. And this just shows the robustness and reliability of, the, of this solution. Very quickly, a brief history of solids. And what is worth mentioning is that first, all six conditions were installed in 2006. And again, till now, they still work with work and are equipped with the original plates uh, for the heat transfer, which just proves a lifetime of a minimum 14 years plus, and therefore very low maintenance costs associated with the operation of the, of the plate uh, technology. In all seeds, there are about 60 installations globally, uh, mainly on rapeseed, soybean, and sunflower, and majority we can find in preparation plants. The technology can serve small capacities ranging from, let's say, few tons per hour, as well as the large production facilities operating with uh, over 5,000 tons per day or higher. However, for each capacity, the majority of the advantages that I'm going to present can be offered. So before we look into all seeds conditioning and its, and, its, and its challenges, so let me just quickly show you how the indirect solid technology works and how it looks like in general. So on the right picture, there is a, there is a cut or a drawing, uh, an example of the plate technology for the heating and cooling of bulk solids, including variety of, of oil seeds. The heart of the, of the conditioners are stainless steel heat transfer plates that are generally two metal sheet, sheets welded together, inflated under certain pressure, and are individually connected to manifolds with flexible hoses. This generally allows thermal expansion that is usually an, an issue with the, with the tube technology and welds cracking. And you can see the details on the left picture where the pipe represents manifolds for the distribution and collection of the heating media. And you can see that each plate is connected uh, independently. This means that uh, if something happens with a plate, it can be isolated without long, long, long downtimes meaning huge production losses generally. The heating media uh, and can be steam, high or low pressure, condensate or hot water, flow inside the well welded plates, either upwards or downwards, depending on the configuration, so coherent or countercurrent. The conditioners are always kept full of product. And on the, on the right picture, there is, a, there is a level of product above the plates. And you can see that the product is falling through the inlet uh, nozzle on the pile of product. At the bottom of the conditioner, there is a discharge feeder. And the primary function of the discharge feeder is to keep the units 
always full of product, basically, not to, not to expose the plates. And the product itself is flowing between the plates uh, by mass flow with very low velocity, and we can say approximately 0 0.5 meters per second. And therefore, the plates do not suffer from abrasion, which is great benefit. And the actual heat transfer is done by the, by the conductivity. Well, um, during the development uh, of the indirect solution, we are observing and discussing operational issues with many soybean processors, processors globally, where, which at the end uh, we are able to identify as. First one, and uh, the very common is that uh, there is a low grade energy available at the plant, mostly from another processes, and there is an economical and environmental motivation to reduce the steam consumption in the preparation process. And this has been quite necessary to, to remain competitive and obviously savings on the processing cost will go directly to the bottom line. Increase of the production, generally studying the total crushing rates um, and we can find this information uh, basically you know, on internet uh, over, over a long term period, we can see that the total crushing amount is, is growing and obviously this needs to be followed by the crushing capacity. And it's difficult not to notice that uh, the production rates and many plants have been maxed up uh, with, the, with the production lines of plants, uh, let's say 20 or 30 years old. And the producers are looking for options how to increase the production rate at, the, at, the, at very minimum capex. Then another, another point is that uh, some of the installations are simply too old, uh, again, like uh, some plants ranging 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, still with the plants using the old technology, for example, cold or hot dehauling process, uh, that obviously were revolutionary at the time of installation. However, step by step, uh, these old installations become obsolete and replaced by more efficient technology, for example, switching to warm dehauling, which is much less energy demanding process. Another, uh, another very important reason uh, that we often hear is the actual condition of the exit existing equipment together with the very high maintenance cost, requiring tubes uh, replacement in, in rotary or vertical seat conditioners. The best condition is usually caused either uh, by abrasion or welds cracking due to the thermal stress, uh, as all these equipments run on, on steam only. And, uh, and the last but not the least and also very common reason is uh, it's increased moisture in the seeds that obviously differs from one region to, to another, but we hear uh, from our clients it's, it's a fairly common issue of soybean, for example, imported from, from Latin America. And in terms of the existing equipment, this is an issue as it was designed to a certain specification, mostly lower moisture removal capacity. And this is an issue for the, for the quality of the final product and the yield efficiency. All the producers simply needs to decrease the production rate to meet the downstream product specification, resulting in a significant production, production losses. Well, to, to address these, these challenges in soybean processing, we focused on the development of indirect heating technology and I came up with a solution that meets the criteria and, and provide a solution for majority of, the, of those issues during the conditioning at the preparation plants. I will start with the, with the bean heating modules. Um, basically, we, we, have, we have two solutions to offer uh, according to the complexity of the needs. First one, as I just mentioned, is a, is a very interesting solution. Uh, we call it uh, solids bean heater modules. And, and basically they, are, they allow for increase of the production rate in the existing units without elaborate and expensive retrofits to replace update, updated and round down tube sections. On the picture, the modules can be noticed uh, itself mounted on top of the standard vertical seat conditions right below the inlet hopper. This solution of the modules together with the innovative plate design uh, doubles, the, doubles the heat transfer area in the same volume compared to the tubes. The compact design allows plants to increase capacity by adding heat transfer area in the same volume and, 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 and footprint. This can be achieved either by adding additional modules on top of the existing systems or replacing existing tube modules that have uh, worn out, for example. 
the plate design also allows for a wider range of choice of heating media, not just steam, but, uh, but it could be, uh, let's say, high and low pressure steam, condensate or hot water. Or the plant can enhance the, the total thermal duty of the unit by switching to the high, higher steam pressure, as I, as I just mentioned. The modules itself are completed out of stainless steel plates mounted on the, on the, on the casing, sorry, in the, in the casing and connected to the manifolds for, for plant heating media hookup. The modules are designed in identical dimensions as the existing vertical seat conditioners uh, known on the market. And this allows a quick and easy replacement with minimum cost. And uh, you can stack up a number of modules on top of each other to meet uh, your new plant uh, requirements. However, uh, the, the bean heating modules didn't answer and help too much if uh, there was a need to increase the moisture removal capacity and still use the advantage of all the benefits resulting from the plate in direct technology. Therefore, bean heating modules were combined with the innovative air sections to provide heating and conditioning at the same time. Modular design itself, it's a, it's a particularly suitable for a combination of waste energy recovery in the, in the top sections. And the lower parts will accommodate steam for a powerful evaporation of the moisture. Between the heating sections, you can notice uh, optimized air modules uh, that have adjustable louvers for optimized uh, grind performance in order to achieve even better grind across the entire bed of product. And the air sections are boxed with the manifolds with access hatches for easy cleaning. The flow of product is controlled by a discharge feeder in a way that the conditioner is entire time of operation full of product. And the conditions are controlled by the temperature and amount of the heating media, uh, mostly steam or hot water. And the drying rate is then controlled by the air, by the heat, by the heat intake. Uh, and again, that heat is coming from the, from the heating media, mostly from the, from the steam, uh, providing the actual evaporation. An amount of air just controls the saturation inside the conditioner and controls the drying performance. So this is the biggest difference compared to the grain dryers that use the hot air uh, for the evaporation and uh, for the drying. Here, basically, we use the heat uh, to, to heat the moisture inside the, inside, inside the beans to evaporate, and then we just use the air to carry the moisture out of the conditioner. Generally, the plate technology within the soybean industry is offered with the dimensions of the common vertical seat conditioners, and, um, and, and, and the same applies for the bean heating modules. And generally it is 3.3 by 3.3 meters and uh, 2.4 by 2.4 meters. Or we can design just a tile made solution to fit individual needs. The heat recovery is, uh, and uh, this is one of the focus of my presentation or paper today. And uh, the heat recovery is a very powerful topic allowing the producers to achieve higher processing mar margins. and. Uh, to stay basically competitive on this highly competitive market. And uh, the price of the oil and meal uh, as a commodity is something that producers probably are unable to influence directly. However, the cost of production can be optimized and uh, taking the fact into consideration that the steam consumption accounts for, accounts for about a quarter of the total processing cost, the, redu the, the reduction on steam consumption makes perfectly sense this also can be connected to government subsidies for energy and CO2 emission savings, depending on, on, on each country, obviously. Well, um, with the definition of low grade waste energy, we know that generally it is a type of energy that is very difficult to, to recover due to its very low temperature. And usually we're talking about energy that has about temperature, say 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees. And, uh, and in oil seeds industry, it will be, or in oil seeds processing, it will be mostly condensate uh, with a temperature around 90 degrees, hot oil in the range, 80, 90 degrees. Again, vapors uh, from the, from the, either from the cookers in, in rapeseed processing or, or vapors from the, from the DTDC at 70, 80 degrees. Uh, so theoretically, the maximum heat recovery that would be possible uh, would happen if the temperature of the source of the waste heat would equal the temperature of the seeds at the inlet of the vertical plate conditioners. So the gap between the green arrow and the black arrow on the screen would be zero. However, in the real world, uh, this is impossible and we would uh, result in a, an indefinite size of the heat transfer area. 
So following the thermodynamics law, it's obvious that if we want to target for an efficient waste heat recovery, we'll need to minimize logarithmic mean temperature difference between the waste heat and the, and the seeds. And as a result of this equation, we'll, we'll basically need a very large heat transfer area. Therefore, we're now talking about the plate technology. When the oil seeds producer decides uh, basically that there is a time to increase the processing margins or to, to reuse the uh, amount of the, of the energy used for, for the processing of, of, of variety of oil seeds, uh, here we're talking about the soybean. And before they start investigate and maybe reduce the steam consumption, First, the source of waste, uh, waste energy and its recoverability needs to be addressed. And in a typical soybean processing plant during the years of solids present, we have identif identified major sources of waste energy. And those will be, uh, for example, flesh, flesh uh, steam, sorry for that, for that uh, or condensate from, from variety of uh, extraction processes or cooling of uh, gas engine or, or gas turbine for the efficient operation of the of the equipment or, or, or for example vapors from drier and, and, and cooler uh, boiler fuel gases uh, with the installation of, of an efficient economizer and and basically other sources from another processes or we can actually think about the vapors from the conditioner if we are able to collect uh, the vapors and they are having uh, basically certain quality with the with the RH and uh, with the temperature. The reason why we're talking about the about the, the, the plate technology is that we can definitely claim that uh, the plate technology can offer the advantage of a very very dense heat transfer area. And if we for example compare plates on the slide on the on the right hand side with the tubes on the left uh, that are a very common solution within the oil seeds industry in the form of, of, of vertical conditioners. Eventually, we can also mention rotating conditioners as a very common solution. We can say that both technologies use similar principle of heat transfer and, and mass flow, except, except rotating equipment. Both technologies are very efficient solution, especially if we do not consider heat recovery. However, the plate technology can offer twice as much heat transfer area within the same space and the heat recovery at the, at the same time. For example, one heating section with a typical dimensions of 3.3 by 3.3 meters and one meter uh, tall modules offer more than 420 square meters of heat transfer area, which compared to the tubes uh, that have approximately 180, 190 square meters is literally twice as much. And being able to process more product within an existing space is important for plants that are looking to increase the production capacity without having to undertake significant retrofit renovations. Simply put, you cannot install more tubes into the same area and they would have to occupy additional space mostly outside of the existing processing plants. And this just means additional investment into new buildings or platforms, uh, new transportation of the product to and out and out of the conditioner and utility distribution, which basically is increasing the, uh, the capex. Generally, if the producers choose the play technology to recover the low grade energy from a waste heat, it needs to be with the help of a heat transfer medium, and it will be most likely uh, hot, hot water. Uh, the hot water loop will have at least two heat exchangers. So the first heat exchanger will be for the source of the heat. And it could be variety. It could, it could, there could be several heat exchangers, obviously, because we can have uh, several uh, sources of the, of the waste heat. And obviously, the second heat exchanger will be the vertical plate conditioner. Um, and in, in, in both, uh, at the same time, we need the most efficient recovery. And uh, this can be done only if the hot water loops operates with the very low flow rate, uh, basically as low as, as possible as, uh, as, the, as the equipment can handle. However, the limitation is that a minimum critical velocities inside the heat exchanger needs to be maintained, uh, as, as we know from, let's say, from the theory of the, of the design of the, of the either for the shell and tube or plate heat exchangers for the turbulent, for the tur turbulent flow inside the, the, the plates in this case. Otherwise, the distribution of the hot water inside is, is, is generally very poor. And we can say that, that due to the profile of the place, there are two welded, there are, as I mentioned, two welded metal sheets uh, together. 
And after, after an expansion as a production step, they have corrugation and at the same time, the possibility to integrate a certain number of the internal passes. We can increase the velocity inside the plates if needed. This means that the plates in general can maintain much lower flow rates necessary for a maximum and efficient heat recovery at the same time. This is basically another one, another of the major advantages of the plate technology and its feasibility for the heat recovery. For, and, and, and we can say that for this reason, majority of the heat recovery installations globally do actually have, have plates. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so we have learned that for an efficient heat recovery, we'll need a large heat transfer area. However, each organization or plant has a different maximum time for the, for the return on investment, and, and this needs to be considered for the, for the total investment. As you can see on the, on the graph on the, on the right-hand side, the more heat we want to recover, the heat transfer is growing exponentially. So at certain size of the heat exchanger, the payback time becomes too long, and the entire project can be, can be easily killed. Therefore, it is very important uh, to find a sweet spot, considering other circumstances that are influencing re recovery rate, like summer and winter conditions, uh, where winter offers much bigger opportunity for the heat recovery due to low seat temperature at the inlet, or the quality of the waste uh, source, for example, saturation of the vapors from the seam or from the cooker, and many other considerations. However, with today's Thermal modeling software, it is relatively easy for us to fine tune the system and find the best acceptable solution. Regarding the plate technology, we can say the, uh, the technology itself uh, can challenge the, the low grade heat. And with a smart integration into, into vertical plate conditioner, a large portion of the heat available can be actually recovered. For this purpose, we can use one of the advantages, and that is actually the module design. On the screen, you can see a stack up of individual modules and dedicate few top modules to bring the waste energy back into the process. And the typical arrangement will be with a hot water recovery loop on the slide on the, on the left or hot water and fly steam on the, on the right hand side. With the source of low grade heat on the primary side of the hot water loop, and obviously it can be multiple sources, as I already mentioned, and solids conditioners with the seed on the secondary side. Generally, there are a number of variables that will influence the efficiency of the, of, the, of the recovery. However, the heat transfer area is one of them. We can dedicate number of heating modules uh, only for the recovery. And on the diagram, you can, you can see there are four of them. Uh, and, but, but generally, adding more sections will not bring the effect, uh, as the temperature of the seeds inside the conventional will already reach the temperature that the further recovery will not be efficient. In average, uh, in, in one heating module or one section, whatever we call it, with a size of 3.3 by 3.3 uh, meters, we can claim about five to seven kilograms of steam per ton of soybean process to be saved. And for example, if we go for maximum four modules uh, for just for the heat recovery, uh, we'll be getting about 20 to 25 tons of uh, steam safe per ton of soybean process. And obviously, you know, due to the nature of the heat recovery, the first sections uh, due to the temperature of steam will be more efficient than the, than the bottom one. And in total, for example, for 5,000 tons per day production plant, the savings will represent approximately 600,000 USD per year and return on the investment between one and two years, assuming approximately, let's say 20, 20 USD per ton of steam. And obviously that varies from one continent or from one country to, to another. And, uh, but we can say that uh, each case needs to be calculated uh, individually. Well, for, for, let's see, so many times we heard the, the question about the lifetime of the plates. Mm -hmm. And frankly speaking, it was, it was difficult to answer because we never experienced these types of questions. Uh, I already mentioned that solids has started with the plate technology about 30 years ago. And majority of the first installations are, or were in, in the fertilizer business for cooling of granulated fertilizer. And in this industry, the main Competitive technology was a fluid bed and simply the lifetime of the equipment was not an issue. 
However, in the OSIS industry, we do have a variety of equipment that generally suffers from abrasion. And this is done due to the nature of the, of the seeds that are very abrasive, and especially we can say rapeseed, uh, soybean, and sunflower. And the wells cracking at this, at this team distribution uh, due to the nature of the, uh, of the thermal expansion and the cracking around the wells. We can see that uh, the, the, the old rotating conditioners, uh, the, the, we can see that uh, on, the, on the old rotating conditioners, uh, the tube needs to be repaired every single year with expensive removal of tube bundle, rewelding or inserting back into the conditioner. And at the same time, we can see it's happening on the old, old vertical conditioners where the entire tube bank needs to be replaced or rewelded X number of, of years. This in combination of material of uh, construction that is mostly stainless steel is making the tube technology is, is making the technology very very costly and, and the repair is, is, is making very costly. Not as tough as but in uh, an overall total cost of ownership where the maintenance cost for the replacement of the tubes needs to be included. In solids, we can still see some original units in operation installed back in uh, in in eighties, still with the original place. And the same we can say about the first all seats uh, units installed uh, around uh, 2005 and our clients uh, do not observe any significant abrasion. Obviously the plates are specified for certain quality of the fluids. The, the conditioners need to be isolated from the plant vibration or the steam system needs to be properly designed in order to avoid, avoid water hammering. So if the general rules are followed, we can say that uh, the plates will last uh, the same time as the conditioner itself. And we can we can easily talk about let's say 15 to 20 years uh, 20 years minimum. And uh, at, at Solex, uh, we can say that our play technology helped to save significant amount of uh, CO2 uh, emissions um, and also other emissions like dust. And out of the 60 OSIS installations, we can easily say that uh, over 90% actually do have a, a heat recovery option installed and operated. And for its for example, for a typical 2000 pounds per day canola plant, when heating the seeds from, let's say, typical temperature 10, 20 degrees to 60 degrees, and if it's done solely by, by a heat recovery, the technology will help to save approximately 2400 tons of CO2 per year. Obviously, not all the plants will have the same amount of heat recovery, and uh, production rates obviously going up and down. However, still, if we multiply each plant of uh, CO2 savings with the number of installations with the heat recovery, we'll get to the total number that we are actually really proud uh, of at, uh, at Solex. So thank you for watching uh, this presentation, uh, for joining us, uh, joining us today. And uh, basically, I hope that uh, we were able, I was able to pass the information about the, the advantages of the, of the technology. And obviously, should you have any questions, we hope that uh, we'll be able to answer to your satisfaction. Eventually, please do, do not hesitate to contact us directly. And thank you for your knowledgeable discussion about heat exchangers. And uh, we have a couple of questions we would like you to address and talk about. The One of our questions is, can plate technology handle the same amount of impurities as tube technology? And what is your experience in this area? Uh, thank you, Nora. Um, my, my, it, it's, it's actually a very, very common question and uh, that, that's a very valid question and we are happy for that uh, because for certain clients it can be a fairly new solution. And, uh, and, and generally we can say that yes, uh, the, the positive news that is that the play technology do not leak inside because we all the, our connections are are outside, so we don't we don't face basically the same issue. What uh, what let's say the I wouldn't say majority, but many of our clients uh, facing at the end of the lifetime of the tube technology where there are, there are a lot of tubes around the belts already leaking, and once you have the leakage inside the conditioner. Obviously, it creates wet spots and it starts agglomeration, smoldering, and other issues. Basically, that can lead to the uh, to the very serious issues uh, or complete blockage of the of, of the heat exchangers or conditioners. And in addition to this, uh, our plate technology can handle also cracked soybean for the core dehulling process uh, with it, with the maximum amount of the house. 
and uh, because obviously sometimes some of the installations have, have a full, some some of them have uh, kind of partial dehoing. But obviously, uh, you know, you know, in in many plants, sometimes uh, there there are offset conditions, and uh, all the holes can flow through the conditioner. And we have a, we have a number of this uh, of this. Uh, cracked soybean conditioners and actually they are working very well and uh, we are very happy to also offer that technology for the for the cold dehoving. Thank you. I've got one more question for you. Uh, I'm sure you have explored the space in Africa in this heat exchanger technology area and how do you intend to increase your footprint in that area? One of the main concerns which we keep hearing is the ability to pay for the equipment and the high cost of new technologies and how that can be incorporated in the sub-Saharan African space. Right, uh, it's a very, very valid question. And uh, obviously, you know, as, uh, as, as, one, as I mentioned, one of our major benefit is the, uh, is, uh, is the energy recovery. So we are actually very, very lucky that uh, we can we can we can offset the cost of the equipment uh, uh, with the energy savings over the time. Obviously, each continent, each country uh, has different cost of the of of the gas or oil, basic basically any source that uh, is generating the the steam. And we know that uh, oil seeds processing is very steam demanding process uh, and can represent big big portion of the total cost. So obviously that's that that that's a, that's a valid point, and uh, we are kind of happy to with each individual producer to sit down to connect uh, to visit and kind of go through the through the individual sources and uh, try to find the, the spot. Okay, if if there is not a big portion of the of the waste energy, obviously how we can do, how, how we can do how we can basically cause the project that is it's acceptable uh, in terms of the. ROI uh, written on investment. Uh, do they need to, let's say, for example, for the for the bed, do, do, do the conditioner needs to meet the, the 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 maximum performance for the entire year, or is it only for two weeks, uh, two weeks time a year? Maybe we can, we we don't need to, um, let's say let's say cover all the peaks uh, yearly peaks. Maybe we can we we can offer a solution that will be will work on one hundred percent. Let's say majority of the year, and for some for some very short period, it might maybe need to reduce a little bit the, the the capacity. So basically, we need to kind of offset the energy with the with the capex and find the find the right spot. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm assuming the the price of energy in Africa is not particularly low. So I think it it may, the technology is very feasible. It is very feasible uh, in Africa compared to the states. Oh, com sorry, compared to the countries. But the energy is very, very, very low, or the cost of energy is very low. Like for example, in Russia, or or it could be also in the in in the, in the United States. So, so particularly in Africa, I think it's actually a very interesting solution. Thank you, Stan. Thank Any you other much. questions? Thank you, and we'll move on to the next speaker, which would be. Good morning. We are we welcome Bigger Horns with GEA today. And GEA, as most of you are aware, is a leading equipment manufacturer in the vegetable oil processing. And we are going to hear from Bigger on the metrics they use in the efficiency of refining of soybean oil with their newer equipment and 
some of their older technologies and how those interface in the European space and context. Thank you, Bigger, and welcome. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you very much, Amy, for this introduction here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to contribute here in this session um, about this uh, pretty interesting topic. Um, yeah, measuring um, quality and efficiency in refining. I, my, my first thought and idea was, um, um, okay, what are the main drivers and is it actually possible to separate measuring quality and efficiency in, in this kind of process here? And um, I tried to put that a bit here on this, on this first slide um, and try to put the main drivers or let's say conditions that we need to, uh, to run a um, refining plant with a um, good and safe quality output and, and also in an efficient way. And, I think one of the main um, the main things that we have to keep in mind is that quality-wise, we are here in a business where we are not looking for an as good as possible um, quality for the oil. It's it's um, much more an as good as necessary um, approach, um, and this is playing directly together with um, with the efficiency of a plant. Yeah? Where on the efficiency side, we see as a main factor for sure, losses. Uh, we, we heard that before. Um, so product loss or yield is actually the main driver on the efficiency side. Um, so I, I put some, some points on the left, um, which I think are really important to run your plan with a reasonable quality. And that is that you for sure need um, to choose the correct process design. So go for the right process itself and you need an, um, you need the correct equipment. You need as well on the quality side for sure reliable analytics. Yeah? So you need a lab in place that can actually um, support you with um, reliable numbers about how your plant is running. Um, to run a good quality, you need a reliable and accurate chemical dosing, which is from our point of view, um, definitely one of the key factors to run a plant um, in an efficient way with a, with a good quality. And you need a reliable process control, which is a bit going um, in the same direction like this accurate chemical dosing. And for the quality side, for sure, um, your feedstock quality uh, can also influence pretty much the, um, the quality of the, uh, of the final product. And as well, for sure, the efficiency. Um, if, you have a, if you have a bad quality um, crude oil in, to be refined in your plan, that will definitely go in and will reduce the efficiency of your plant because you will, yeah, you have to do a lot more effort when refining a, a bad quality feedstock um, compared to a good quality one. And as you can see here, marked with the arrows here in the middle, um, we have a lot of a lot of conditions that do count for both sides. Yeah? We need the correct process design and equipment for sure as well to run to run the process in in an efficient way. We also need the analytics to really know where we are. Um, we, we need an accurate chemical dosing for sure and to not overdose chemicals and waste it and also not to underdose and maybe run into quality issues. Um, and we, uh, we, need, uh, we need a reliable process control. And for sure, process settings um, have to be adjusted to the feedstock quality always. And one point is, which is not really mentioned here, but this is, um, I mean, it's it's actually quite obvious. I, I, um, I think the reliability and availability of your process and is is extremely important. So it's not only about losses. I, I like the statement of Ken Carlson, which he uh, is always bringing up, uh, saying like that one day of downtime in your refinery um, usually costs you around the profit of a month, and if you just keep that in mind, that is, um, it's giving an idea of how important it is to, to keep your plant running and have your process under control all the time um, to run it efficiently um, with, a, with a reasonable quality. Um, and, and so quality and efficiency are always going hand in hand. Um, if, you, if you produce um, um, extremely good quality, you will usually be completely inefficient because you were over treating your oil um, and if you were going in 
too efficient way, uh, that might actually influence your or compromise on the quality side, and maybe you are producing out of spec product which you cannot sell. So it's it's going hand in hand, and um, that means um, a lot of these things that we will look at in the following minutes. Um, they, they will they, that will actually account to both sides, yeah, quality and efficiency. The first the first thing we have to decide for is um, the the right processes. Yeah, for soybeans here, this is an overview of um, let's say the um, edible oil recovery and refining processes. Um, for soybeans, it's rather simple. So you're going through the extraction, and usually that's followed by a water degumming step here and yeah, for the good quality soybean oil, uh, a chemical neutralization process, um, which I still think is um, the most the most efficient and reliable process combination here. To have a look on these two processes and how they work, um, I just have two slides here. We cannot go too deep into it, but I think this is also not um, not the most important thing here. Um, a water degumming usually run at uh, 75 to some around 90 degrees. That depends on the conditions. Um, here, um, with the water addition corresponding to the phosphatite content, this is this is already the first point that I mentioned before. What we need is a is a chemical dosing. In this case, here water dosing, um, according to the the crude oil conditions and analytics. Um, we need some mixing. We need some hydration time and and a well a well um, a well adjusted separator here um, to do a proper separation with an with an oil loss in the gums of not more definitely not more than thirty five percent oil in the dried gums that should be uh, actually the minimum target here um, for sure this process is also available in an enzymatic way to make it even more efficient but this is um, this is a question of do you want to uh, to dry your lecithin here? Um, yes or no? Um, it's possible with a simple water degumming with this um, um, with the enzymatic process. That's um, that's a bit difficult and doesn't work with the lecithin. But um, yeah, that depends. But let's say the preconditions that you need to run the process are actually the same. You need to have your process under control, and you always need to know what your process is doing. The next step after the water degumming um, is usually a two-stage neutralization. Um, it's running at a slightly higher temperature here, and we have some more chemical dosings for sure. So we adjust the temperature in the first step. Uh, it's, um, we need an acid dosing, um, always depending on the residual phosphorus content that we have to remove. Um, we, we have a holding tank for, for the acid, and then we have a caustic dosing usually also directly according to the FFA content in your oil. And for a soybean oil, we definitely need this um, this retention time here um, of 50 to 15 to 20 minutes um, before the first separator. Um, to reduce the losses um, in this process step here, we always recommend to use a pre-degummed -de oil. Uh, pre um, so the, the water degumming first will definitely improve your loss situation here. Down here, some, some figures of the achievements of that process. It's a very reliable process, um, which can handle all, all different kinds of, of crude oil quality. So it's pretty, um, yeah, it's really a reliable thing and can, can handle most of the different available qualities, let's say. One of the questions is why do, why do we recommend here to go for a chemical neutralization where um, in other areas the physical refining is much more um, is much more coming up um, due to the lower losses in a in a physical refining from from my point of view um, the FFA content in the standard um, soybean crude oil is actually quite low it's it's somewhere it shouldn't be higher than 0 0.7 0 0.8 maybe. And for this low FFA content, um, the let's say the effect on the slightly higher losses due to the chemical refining are definitely more than covered the, by the, the quality um, the quality advantage. Now this chemical treatment here is really bringing the quality um, to a different level and makes this whole quality control 
much easier. Yeah? So you will definitely get a higher quality end product with this um, chemical neutralization process here. Basically, you can use the same installation um, for a physical refining as well, for sure. But um, in this case here, I, uh, I, I chose the neutralization stage. Um, we can now switch to uh, the different um, equipments. One of the points mentioned before was we need the correct equipments. Um, um, we as Gea, we are we are manufacturing centrifuges, so um, separators. Um, so this is for sure one of our main main targets and topics here. And some statements about the development of separators is that from from our point of view, we think that the bowl design and disc design and let's say the design of the separation process itself is pretty much mature it's um we don't really expect huge steps forward in in the separation process itself what we see in the market and in in all the factories running our separators is that um, the, the, the adjustment of the machines um, according to the process conditions has a much higher impact. And we still see that some of the features in the machines are not actually used in a, in a sufficient way. Right? So it's, um, it, the machines are usually not really perfectly adjusted to the process conditions. It means feed and outlet pressure to make sure that uh, the acceleration in the machine is running, running smooth. Um, and, and the fine tuner and diameter adjustment and dislodging intervals and times had to make sure that you were not um, wasting oil with your dislodging. And that's that's also one point where our design departments are actually focusing on. Yeah, we are um, we are more and more looking for automation of the machines and looking for higher availability. As I said before, each day of downtime really costs a lot of money. So what we have to make sure is that the machines are running smooth um, at least on what 350 days a year um, with, with no unexpected downtime, uh, if possible. For sure, energy efficiency is also an interesting point. Utilities reduction and noise reduction. But um, that, that's all nice to have, but the first thing is we, we need to keep the machines running and have to increase the availability. Um, to explain quickly on the, let's say the two main features that we have is um, we we have a hydro feed, a so-called hydro feed, and the, the other manufacturers of centrifuges, they have a different name for it here. Um, and it's technically a different a different solution, but it's tackling actually the same problem. Um, we are giving the oil in our um, in our in our process. We are giving it some time to grow particles as big as possible. And what can happen if you don't adjust the machine properly here in the center? Um, you will destroy all the particles again and make the separation job a bit um, more difficult for the separator, which has an impact on on the. Uh, on the quality side coming out of the separator and then in the following steps for sure also in the, for the efficiency. The, the second thing here is the fine tuner, which is um, um, an adjustable centripetal pump here for the heavy phase, which helps you to adjust the, the, the position of the separating zone in, in the disk stack um, yeah, under running conditions. So you don't have to change any mechanical parts here. You can just do it from outside from the control system. And uh, yeah, that's that are the, the, the two main main features that are used to, to adjust the separator for the process. Here are two pictures of the hydrohermetic feed and how it works. On the left here, we see um, we see an inlet pipe without this hydrohermetic disc here. Um, and you see the, um, the feed really splashing into this distributor area here. This part here is rotating with, I don't know what, 4,800 RPM. Um, this here is a standstill part, so you can uh, imagine that you put a lot of shear forces into the oil when the oil hits these acceleration veins here. On the right side, you see the situation how it should look like. Um, this has an hydrohermetic feed here, so we see that it's actually sealed by the liquid itself, and that is a way smoother acceleration into the machine and bringing it up to speed, and that is has a huge influence on the separation efficiency. This is a picture of 
Thank you, Unair. Just to give you an idea how it works here, you can turn it around this axis here and you can change the diameter of the heavy phase discharge, which gives you the, the option to, um, to really adjust, adjust your separator to many different process conditions, changing process qualities, changing your chemical concentrations. Um, so a change in your caustic concentration is, is directly followed by a change in the in the density situation between your oil and heavy phase. And that has to be adjusted by a fine tuner just to make sure that your separating zone is always in the right in the middle of the rising channel. So in the perfect position to get the best possible separation performance. It makes the handling of the machine much easier. So you can start it up easier. You can pull the separating zone inside to be on the safe side and not having breakovers. Um, it, it can reduce the power consumption and it gives you a pretty high flexibility, which, which is much more important if you run different processes on the same machine. Um, but actually it makes your machine adjustable perfectly to the process conditions. Another important point um, to run your plant efficiently is the degree of automation. Um, what we see in, in the world is we, we see everything from completely fully automated um, down to more or less completely manual. Um, I have a pretty clear opinion about that. It's um, what we need is we need a semi-automation for our kind of plants and uh, refining plants. Semi-automation means um, I don't need the whole factory automated and just push a button and everything starts up or is emptying the complete plant. The only thing important from my point of view is for sure you need all temperature controls and all level controls and the tanks automated. But the main and most important thing is you have you need to have your chemical dosings automated. That has to be that has to run completely automatic because this is one thing that an operator can never actually monitor in a proper way compared to what a PLC can do. And another point for sure is a loss monitoring. If we come to efficiency, um, um, you need to know um, how much crude oil is going in and you need to know how much, um, let's say, refined oil is coming out of your dryer um, just to have an overview of what your losses are. And that's actually pretty simple simple to manage, you just need mass flow meters and the, be the beginning, so the feed line and uh, the discharge line from, um, from the dryer. This optional level here, fully automated, this is from my point of view, definitely. Maybe it makes sense in some reasons, but from my point of view, this year is more than enough um, product switches, emptying a plant, starting it up, everything can run manually, no problem with that, but your chemical dosings are the key the key for success in with your plant, and that has to be automated. And we will see in the following slides um, how, from my point of view, a chemical dosing system should look like to run an efficient plan with a safe, let's say, with a safe quality and always running with a proper quality. Um, what we see pretty often is the system where you just pre-mix a caustic here in a storage tank, yeah, making it on what, 14% or making it 12% caustic solution. Um, having usually no strainer here and just having a, a membrane pump or something like that, um, just a dosing pump. Yeah? It's a dosing pump usually having a safety valve back into the, into the tank because it's positive displacement and then it goes into the into the process and it's this is something which i consider not to be really under control uh, that is a um, positive displacement pump just counting counting strokes um considering that each and every stroke is has the same size and all the chemical is really going into the process which might be the case for the first six months but um after a year or two um i'm not really sure if this is still the case and the system is as well pretty unflexible yeah? because just giving it a try to change your caustic concentration by a percent or maybe two up and down to see what the influence is on the process, which can actually have a big influence on 
um, the separation performance and on the uh, on the outcome parameters of f of a and it can actually have a, a pretty big influence but it's extremely difficult to change it here yeah? you, you just have to have to wait until it's empty and then you have to refill it with a different concentration and if you find out that it doesn't work then it's a hell of work to 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 bring it back to to work with this system here you can just change in the plc that i want to done those now 12 percent instead of 14 and the plc will immediately um adjust the amount of water which is added here so the only thing you do in the PLC is you say, okay, I have an FFA of this and that much, FFA of 0.7, and I want to dose 10% excess caustic, and this will define the amount of caustic that we need, and the concentration, the final concentration given to the PLC will define the amount of water here, and so you you can you can play around with your chemical dosings and the parameters and find the best possible setup. Um, and you see the results within half an hour usually this is how it should look like um this is a this is the proper solution um you just type in your um your crude oil your crude oil parameters you see here the ffa content um with one percent and it, sometimes it's 0.8 sometimes 0.7 whatever you get from your lab you can just type it in here and the control system will just recalculate immediately what the new the new dosing amount is um, you can you type in your initial concentrations you type in your dilution so the final concentration do, uh, dosed into the process um, and everything is taken care of by the control system no matter if you increase the flow from 10 tons per hour to 12 the system will immediately follow and will always dose the accurate amount of of, of chemicals this is the way how we think chemical dosing should be designed. Now we are going one, one step further in this, um, in this, uh, in the analytics, let's say, this is really, um, this is really a step forward here. Um, we can use a near infrared online monitoring system. So we can, uh, this is here is an example of a, um, with a light face, so the clean oil outlet from a separator. Um, and that shows really um, a complete trend of the phosphorus content coming out of a uh, degumming plant. And this is really giving you an immediate feedback of about if your changes in the process and the adjustments are going in the right direction or not. And uh, to show you what, what this might be good for is, think about this graph here um, which is showing still the phosphatite content and think about your your operators took the last sample at 12 o'clock here and the next sample is then taken at eight um uh, it, it would have been great to know that already here that something is going wrong um and that would have been possible in this case here in the installation the the operators were not really taking care for it because it was just a test installation um but um yeah, as you can see here, here they found it out in the morning and they made just one total ejection here and cleaned their disk stack again. And after one hour um, or two, everything was back to normal. Um, that could have happened actually almost a day before without any problems. Yes, this is a bit more installation work for sure. And that's a quite, um, yeah, that's not, not as easy as it looks like maybe, but this is really a pretty good option to keep your quality under control and to make sure that you always know exactly what your plant is doing. What else do we have? This is, um, this is something that we are right now starting to implement in all our separators, uh, which are built on our site. Um, we call that cloud monitoring and trending. Um, basically it's, um, it's here on the left side, you see the IO system. So that's the controls of our separators and sometimes some, some uh, let's say process data around as well. Um, and it's going through an IOT gateway. We are, uh, so an internet of things gateway, we are transferring process data or our machine data into a cloud storage. And that makes it possible to view it from everywhere and every time um, in some kind of a dashboard here. Uh, so it's really a real-time and a trending function uh, which always gives you 
no matter if it's in your office, in your computer, or if it's on your tablet, or if it's on your smartphone, when you are in the traffic jam driving to the plant, you can always see what is your machine doing? What is the separator doing? Is it running fine? Or can I do some, some changes or is there any problem? Um, a pretty simple thing, um, not really a lot of cost involved. That's really a simple, a simple feature giving a much better overview of what the separator is doing. Um, remote access, is, um, it looks a bit similar, but uh, it, it's going one step further. Um, so this is giving giving us actually from Germany, for instance, it's it's giving us the chance to um, to even work on the software. Yeah? If we if there is an issue or a misunderstanding or something is not clear in in the machine software, maybe during a commissioning or after a service, um, then we have the chance to to really get remote access to the to this uh, to the control system and the software we can make changes and we can really quickly support um all commissioning things going on or let's say troubleshootings um on the machine which is saving a lot of time um in case that happens and and this is coming back then to um the statements from the beginning that uptime is really the key to run your plant in an efficient way uh, one one of the most um, important efficiency factors, I would say, is uptime. And if you can avoid two, three days of waiting for a technician um, just by having a remote access um, installed in your controls, that can really make a big difference um, for the efficiency of your plant. This is how it looks like. Um, so our technicians have the full full access, if if you allow for sure. Um, that needs some special uh, um, approval from uh, from the operator side. Um, we have the full access and we can make changes in the software and, and help troubleshooting. And um, that's basically it from my side about uh, quality and efficiency um, topics. Thank you very much for listening. And yeah, if we have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Bigger. Uh, thank you for your talk on the centrifuges. I have a question for you. Do you use turbidity controls or turbidity meters on the inlet and outlet oil? Because the NIR technology, I think, is relatively new. How does that compare and what are your thoughts on it? My thoughts on it is um, we made a lot of trials with um, turbidity measurement it works in many, many different applications around separators, but I've never seen a turbidity measurement really working reliable on a refining, on a refining separator. Um, from my point of view, I, I have seen so many different oil qualities where sometimes an oil looks pretty clear and brilliant and the analytics were terrible. And I also saw the other way around and from my point of view, there is no clear relation between turbidity measurement and, and the final oil quality. This is something that, let's say, only the NIR, maybe there are others as well, but um, only an analytical um, method like the NIR can actually really um, bring up um, reliable information about your oil quality. So I, I don't really think that, um, that turbidity measurement can actually compete with that. Would be, it NIR would be great. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, uh, no, lost it. Go ahead. Okay. Is, the, is the NIR used at any processing plants throughout the world right now? Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't think in this particular place it, it is 
pretty well well known actually for 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 meal analytics for moisture and this kind of stuff. So it is already present. It is also present in each and every lab, I would say, but it's not really common to use it for the liquid and and really for process monitoring yet. We are also still working on uh, um, some some tests to to improve the situation around the heavy phase analytics uh, because this is what everybody's aiming for uh, knowing the oil content in your soaps coming from a separator this is i mean as you can imagine this i mean this is a pretty uh, high risk stuff not not really homogeneous and and yes getting some reliable data out of it is a bit more tricky than just from the from the clean oil for the clean oil i would say that works pretty well um for the heavy phase, we are still working on it to find really a reliable setup. We, we made pretty good progress there, but it, it's not really uh, completely ready, let's say. But for, for the oil phase, so crude oil analytics about phosphorus, also FFA is uh, running pretty well. Um, and also for the separator outlet, I think that is um, that works pretty good. All right, we have a question from the panel here. And the question is, uh, does the quality metrics work with fortification? Hmm. I don't really get the question. Um, I didn't understand that either about fortification. Are they talking improvement in quality or is, are we talking improvement in throughput? I don't know. No. Well, if I, whoever I, put this question can explain that. A little bit yeah. more, we will be able to answer it at the end of the session. All right. Thank you, Brigger, and uh, appreciate your time taken to explain the centrifuge technologies and the advancement in NIR and those kind of issues. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other closing comments from Bigard, Stan, or Mike? I was going to uh, comment, uh, pick up on the comment I think Bigger's made about using turbidity meters. And our experience in wastewater has been about the same as his in oil. Um, they're, they're useful to reflect a major upset in a process sometimes, but to calibrate them and pull a number off it and say this is an equivalent oil in Greece or COD value just has not worked well. There's at least one major US processor who has attempted to standardize all of their wastewater management around these turbidity meters and um, I've worked with them a lot and they're just, they're very hard to keep calibrated and probes cleaned and uh, it's, in my view, it's not been successful at all and yet they continue to uh, pursue it as a strategy. But uh, in any case, uh, I my experience has been similar to Bigger's. Good for an upset, but not for calibration. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. I, I mean, and, and uh, at the end, for sure, um, the, the idea of this NIR technology is not to to keep it in the way that just monitoring it. I mean, for sure, in uh, the more experience we get with that technology, we, we want to go for sure further and see that that maybe we can uh, we can adjust the process more or less automatically based on these values, and that it will definitely not be possible based on a turbidity um, measurement. Maybe that can uh, um, that can avoid um, a big a big issue with your centrifuge, and you can maybe get aware of it, but. Uh, that, that's not really the goal of uh, this kind of uh, of measurement or process monitoring that we are aiming for. So I know you touched on the NIR, but tell me just a little bit more about it because I'm not real. What does it measure and what does it attempt to do? Um, 
for sure what we want to do is we want we want to measure everything that is relevant for the oil quality itself yeah. um, the first thing that we started measuring is for sure the crude oil is taking the most important parameters from the oil that are relevant for for the process settings and the chemical dosings it means um, phosphorus content um, or phospholipid content whatever you uh, calibrate it for um, and FFA is for sure important for the settings. Um, th that is pretty helpful. If you, if you change a crude oil tank from one to the other, you see immediately what is happening without somebody waiting for two, three hours to be, be, be sure that the oil is really in the plant and taking a sample, bringing it to the lab, analyzing it, bringing it back. So that is, um, that is all much quicker. And um, from my point of view, even more important is, is for sure they're getting the immediately the results of your separator. What is your moisture content? So about the separation performance. Um, we are still looking for, a, for a, um, reliable soap values in that test plan that was not really possible to analyze that, but uh, that should be no problem at all. And phosphorus um, analytics works pretty well. Um, so, so that's basically the idea. You have a 100% monitoring and you can exactly see what the outcome from your separator is. You, you can even see what happens during, during an ejection and changing your fine tuner diameter. You can immediately see what, what your phosphorus content and the oil quality is doing. So that is actually giving a very, very powerful tool um, to optimize your process. You, you can change a little bit on the left and, and, and after some minutes, uh, depending on retention times for sure. And, um, usually after uh, after minutes or at least after an hour, you can you can see what the results are, um, and that is really giving a very very strong process control to your plant, and you always know what's going on. And so you what can, are the challenges in calibration and maintaining pro clean probes and such as that? Um, clean probes is um, for the normal process conditions where let's say putting it into an oil stream is not so much of a, of a problem that works pretty well calibration is for sure a little bit of work in the background yeah so the operators have to take samples from time to time um, they put some um, time marks or time stamps into the system i'm saying okay i took a sample at this and that time bringing it to the lab and then for sure, bringing back the lab analytics into the system to make sure that the system is always adjusted um, from the different NIR spectrums to, um, to the analytical data coming from the lab so that the system is constantly um, working on optimizing the, the database to, um, uh, to, to give the right values, let's say, because that is, um, that is something that can, can be a bit different between different oil types and and, and uh, maybe times of the year, so depending on the season, there might be some some changes in it. But um, it's it is something that that can be handled. Yeah? You 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 need a lab in place anyway. Um, and what you have to do is that your operators are taking sample as always. They bring it into the lab. the The biggest point is then you always have to make sure that you put the right data into into your NIR system to make sure that it's comparing. Um, with the right analytical data in the background. So, but it, um, okay. Can I, can I have a question to Mr. Berger? Yes. Um, what is uh, your experience or your comments about uh, the use of uh, centrifuges uh, for uh, feedstock, poor feedstock purification which is now uh, nowadays is a lot customer asking for that. And um, as you well know, in Germany, we have uh, um, many customers that they are using only centrifuge. I'm speaking about the first generation biodiesel. And, and after the centrifugation, they do washing and drying and convert it to the biodiesel. In the second generation HVO, where it's high free fatty acid, high amount of the impurities, what is uh, your experience in this aspect? Because we have heard that eventually these refineries or these uh, uh, are going to, to think about uh, placing treatment step after the centrifuge because of the poor quality waste treat stock. Yeah, um, that, that is not 100% my, uh, um, my focus area, but... Um... Uh, to be honest, this is really a tricky thing. Uh, pre-treating this HVO for 
um, for this HVO diesel process is, is really a bit, uh, a bit difficult. And we are working with different things here. We are working with acid treatments and um, cleaning the oil in, in a separator after an acid treatment, but it seems like it, it has to be combined somehow with a bleaching process. Um, afterwards, we also have projects going on where we are talking about a decanter centrifuge just to remove, let's say, the huge load of dirt which is, which is coming with the oil, um, just to be able to treat it afterwards with a, um, let's say, in a, in an in an acid degumming or in an acid treatment step. Um, so it's pretty difficult from my point of view to really say, okay, what is the experience? We are still working on building up the experience here and, 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 and designing a, a well-working process for it. Um, so um, yeah, but if you, if you want some more information about that, for sure, you can, you can actually contact me or through NARA or whoever. Um, so I can bring you in contact with our specialists all around these biodiesel processes. Um, that's no uh, no problem, and we can definitely share some more information then. I think I know all of them. I get myself in contact with them, and they know me also. <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's oil world is definitely small. Yeah, it? yeah, it's correct. It's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Because that was an in see, interesting topic. Yeah. No, because we see that that is uh, the... Um, request from the customer size for the purification of, of uh, um, feedstock poor quality with high free fatty acid is increasing mm -hmm. dramatically. That is unbelievable. And, and new yep. refineries are coming and, and, and it, when US start, then, then everything's get 10 times more important. And that is now the, in, in uh, US, we see that that that's more new refineries are coming for, for HVO. And, and I wanted really to know, because I believe the use of centrifuge combined with the treatment give the best results. Yeah, that is, uh, that is actually the status that we are on. For sure, some detailed work is always in progress in our, in our lab as well to, to make even some more steps forward to, to reach a, a reasonable quality. So I, I think we are not at the end, but I, I agree with what you say. It needs a combination, definitely. Yeah. But you know also, sorry, that my last point that, that there are uh, uh, um, customers that they want to uh, avoid centrifuges and they try to adjust the oil by dilution with a good oil. Uh, and, and via this way, they can uh, skip the centrifuge yep. steps and going directly after the acid degumming directly to the treatment step. Yeah. Yeah, from the point of view of a uh, of a separator manufacturer, that it's not nice, but it's that's that's what it is. Um, yeah, well, I would comment on the HVO uh, or renewable diesel, which I assume is the term you're using here. Is it's it's I've been very involved in it for the last ten years in the U.S. and it's real interesting. First of all, to watch this small vegetable oil family that. Berger referred to interface with the petroleum oil, uh, much larger family, and watch the technology and the uh, the investment thinking uh, differences come to light. Um, I, I think that uh, this is going to be one of the most dramatic changes to this industry in a very long time. I see huge feedstock availability issues developing, and that's going to drive the quality down to where people are gonna use anything they can get to make this out of. I don't see this becoming next year's problem in Africa, but Africa certainly has a big uh, petroleum oil presence, and one can see that if they get a lot of uh, area and cultivation, it may become a challenge over there as well. Uh, Probably the biggest issue I see coming in that industry is uh, the comment I made that people are spending 90% of their time thinking about the wastewater and 10% thinking about the residuals and they need to be thinking about it the other way because just dealing with the gums and residuals is just a huge issue and it's going to change the 
su whole supply demand uh, paradigm for, for feed fat and other secondary oil uses of products in the United States. And I'm sure everybody's seen the same thing and it's going to be fascinating to watch it develop. All right, thank you, Mike. Stan, you have any comments? Oh, um, thank you, Nora, but uh, probably not to this uh, not to this topic. Um, Jeremy, I think it's uh, it was it was real pleasure basically to be able to contribute, uh, let's say, to to the different topics, uh, including on the on the energy savings on on our side and. Uh, as I'm saying, I don't have a, like uh, another comment, let's say, to the wastewater treatment, but uh, we'll be definitely happy to to, to help, uh, or let's say, reduce the energy consumption to to many of the of the potential users in uh, in, in in Africa. All right, Amy. I think uh, we don't have any other questions at this time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining in on this session. And uh, Mike, Stan, uh, Bigger, and uh, Masood, thank you for taking the time to educate and inform our customers and uh, subscribers from the African zone. And uh, thanks to AOCS for enabling this to happen. And uh, if there's any other questions, we will take it at this time. Otherwise, have a great day and uh, 